take some actions, and we have API client, which actually some kind of or let's say service, which just API, API client. As you can see there, I marked uh, the dependency. And in that case, API key and timeout is getting from the uh, environment variables. In uh, the service, we initialize API client directly in the init method, and the main uh, function as a controller uh, mm, just run that service. And how, how we actually could improve uh, that code? Basically, as you can see there, now API client is decoupled from knowing where it comes uh, from. I mean, the, the, those parameters, API key and timeout. It, and for us, for now, it doesn't matter how you get that value. You can get it from the database, from environment variables, or the config file. For the API, API client, it doesn't matter for now. The dependency is just decoupled. The same for the service. We receive already ready to proceed your requests um, API client. We're not initializing anything. And the same for the main service. It just receive as a parameter the service which should be which we should just run. Uh, so basically that's it. Uh, let's take a look now for the real use case of, of example. Uh, let me maybe start from the first one. Uh, the first one is a cryptocurrency application COI, which allows us to perform some operations of cryptocurrency exchangers. And now I have also a question for you. How many people know what does it mean actually cryptocurrency application and, uh, for example, how many people know something like Binance or FTX or Bitfinex or something like that? Okay, not that bad. Actually, I will explain you really, really simple words. You all have uh, bank accounts and you want to invest some money. Each of that accounts, I'm pretty sure that each of them, have a possibility to invest some money in stocks. You want to buy Apple, Google, whatever you want. And you have a different bank accounts. You have Pekawa and Bank and stuff like that. And I, I have a request for the developer. I want to have application to not enter in each time in my bank account and uh, making some operations. I want to have standardized application and doing that in one place. I don't want to enter in that uh, different applications. And basically, that applications do exactly that. You just provide uh, which application you want to use. In that, let's assume that it's Pekao Bank. And you want to get information about your stocks. How many I don't know stocks you have from Apple, what is the net worth of the months, and uh, stuff like that. But also, if you provide M-Bank, you will get information from your M-Bank. In cryptocurrency application, both of, this, of those services are provide its own API, and you have API key. The only thing what you need actually to connect to that service is just an API key. And yeah, this is basically the main idea of that application. And now, let's take a look on the possible architecture, how it could look like. Let's assume, I will, yeah, a bit later I will jump directly into the code snippets and we even will have some kind of demo. But yeah, let's assume that we have some kind of clients. We have HTTP client which is basically responsible for making the request for that uh, service, I mean Binance or Bitfinex, uh, and we just inherited from that client to authorize it in a proper way. Each of that, uh, it's really obvious that each of those platform will have his own methods to authorize it. Now, there we go with our interface, okay? What we see there, on that interface, we have a dependency, it's a client. Client which will make a request for that external API. We have URL paths to get some information. And it's obvious that for different platforms, that URL paths would be different. And we have the set 
of the operation, what we can make using that crypto exchange processor. It's just standardized for everything. I mean, we want that our um, application will be able to ping a client, to check a connection, get account information, and place order, show the candle. Moreover, from that screenshot, from that architecture, we have see some of the responses. We also have models, like if I want to get an account, I will get account details. It's a username or balances. Yeah, some, some kind of balance. We have uh, order details, for example, status and what was the price, and candle details. Candle details is some kind of stock. For example, Apple and price, it was 10,000, let's assume. And now, let's take a look how it's actually communicate. I hope it would be clear enough, but uh, I will jump into the code uh, just after that. Simple example, we just run our application. We provide in which exchange. Exchanger is basically Binance or Bitfinex. We provide a secret key to make that operations. Our controller is just a click. Yeah, it's basic Python uh, CUI application. Uh, we initialize our client. Yeah, maybe I will move my mouse. We initialize our client and we receive back our crypto exchange processor, which will be basically ready to make our requests. We just ping in our client, we check the connections, we receive response from our service, for example, from Binance, that everything great, okay, we could proceed further. Uh, but at this point, we could destroy our application. If, uh, for example, secret key was wrong, the Binance will answer, sorry, bro, you don't have an access to do that. And we will destroy. But let's assume that everything was great, and we will be asked, okay, which action you want to perform? In that case, I want, for example, get account. We provide that information that we want to get account. We make in the request for that application, we receive some response, and we receive that account, we receive, we receive some account details. And that's basically it. That's basically all from that application. Let's take a look how it looks like from the code perspective. We have sources, is it big enough for you? If I will open. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Something like that? Okay. Yeah, it would be really hard to read, but yeah. <laughs> we will try. Our HTTP client is just as you can see there, it's just responsible for making requests. Uh, first of all, there would be no implementation details because it's, it would be a mess if I would show you how, how we need to, uh, to proceed information to get uh, from different resources. There would be no implementation details. But our HTTP client just responsible for making requests for the external services. We have our Binance client this actually just initialized, and somehow we will get signature to authorize our client. And the same for the Bitfinex. As you can see, they are pretty the same. There are some additional methods, but there is no interfaces involved yet. And now, let's take a look of how our exchange processor are implemented. We have one main controller uh, called Crypto Exchange Processor. We have uh, as a dependency client, as you can see, it's actually a good trick in Python, and I strongly recommend you to, do use, to use that, that uh, we creating our own type which is bounded to the HTTP client. Whenever the type you wanna use, for example, Bitfinex or Binance, it just should follow an interface of HTTP client. And there, we defining that we have a quest variable URL path to check connections, you, you want to check connection, and it's obvious that for different different platforms, the way of check connection would be the same because yeah, just URL is not the same for everyone. And we have some URLs, we have pin clients, we have show candles. Now at this point, we don't have any implementation, but already we have a brief idea what is the purpose to have exchange processor. It's it's showing me candle. I'm entering. I know that if I want to see candle details, I know the response. 
I already know a lot of information without implementing any lines of code. It's just an interface. And just take a look how our exchange processors looks like. Fuck, it's, it's really big enough. Uh, we have, we just inherited from Crypto Exchange processor. We have some um, URL paths we, in that case, for, the, for example, for Binance, it's uh, yeah, that one. And we have uh, all our methods. And if we compare that exchange processor, Binance, with Bitfinex, they are pretty the same. And thanks for the interface, we standardize the way how we want to extend actually our client. If tomorrow I will decide that, okay, I want to make requests not for the Binance and Bitfinex, but also for FTX, I will just add one more class inherited from the interface and already know what it should do. And yeah, for me it's actually it looks pretty good, I'd say. Mm, okay, let's uh, jump to the second uh, example, or uh, or anyway we can run it. I will show you how it looks like from. Yeah, I'm not sure it's visible enough, but what's going on there? We 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 are just trying to initialize our clients. We are using. Binance Exchange processor we receive as a parameter Binance client with our own secret key. We ping in client and this point we could destroy and uh, if we successfully after rise, we will get an information from account. Let's maybe me try to run it. Mm. Is it big enough? Okay, we have that command, actually Python 3 app exchange, we want to run Binance and we have some secret key. If you run it right now, we have non-status stock code because yeah, there are no implementation details, but if we go there and we provide that, it's actually return, there are definitely there should be some logic for making the request for that exchange processor, but for now, let's assume that we have uh, know that logic and the status code is actually 100, something like that. Okay, we successfully have to rest our client and which action you want to perform. For example, I want to perform get account. Yeah, I would be asked to provide for each day I want to get account. We, we got none because we, there is no information about our account, but we can use account details, username, for example, Andrew, and our balances is actually a dict of Bitcoin. And we have one. No, let's run again. Successfully actorized. We are getting account. We provide some data. And yeah, we just have uh, our PyDentic model parsed in the right way. Okay, let's move on to the next example, no, but not necessary. Test email services. Uh, let me open that one and that diagram. Okay. And let's make it bigger. Okay, let's assume that we have uh, an application where we offer to our clients a trial environment to some, for example, two weeks to test our application. We, yeah, we follow in microservices architecture and we have uh, one component which is actually responsible for getting new client, uh, parsing them, uh, yeah, just save an information, validate and send the link to, to the environment. Basically, the workflow is the next one. The client comes to us and fill the form of on the, using landing page. It's, a, it's actually UI. We send data to the processor. In that case, it's that component service. 
which is responsible for validating user data, send an activation email, and send confirmation mail. I mean, in the uh, when user only entering in our page and fill out the form, we want to send uh, activation email. User get read that email content. Yeah, maybe I will also move my mouse. Uh, read that content, click an activation link from email, and it should be redirected to the environment instance, and it's ready to use. Then, uh, as a last action, we should uh, send confirmation mail for that user, and that's basically it. And we wanted to test that logic. In Python, I'm not sure how, how you would do that. Uh, I hope that you would not just mock SMTP server and uh, doing exactly nothing, but uh, the way how I implemented that, I just kind of patch SMTP server, which is responsible for sending emails, and uh, I'm not sure that you are aware, but uh, there are some kind of uh, catchers. Uh, one of them is mail catcher or mail hawk. It's basically the tool which will handle your request to send an email and will catch in your own inbox. And you will be able, there are some API to read that content. And that's basically how I test it. Okay? And there I also use an interfaces. And uh, at this stage, I have two interfaces. You know, let's assume maybe I, I will show you also the, basically the scenario, what I wanted to test. For example, that one. I'm on the landing page, then I requested a new environment. Environment is not created yet. I click an activation email link from email. I was redirected to the customer environment instance, and I'm receiving an email that confirms environment creation. Let's aim only on that and see why it's implemented in that way. I have two interfaces. First one is SMTP service. And the second one is message parser. It's actually two separate components, but they are communicate, um, communicate between others. And uh, our SMTP service, I, firstly, I just, what, what I wanted to test, I just described you what I wanted to test. And now I came up to the how I wanted to test it. And uh, in my opinion, the most reasonable way would be indeed read an email content, get the message from the last, get the content from the last message, parse it, get environment activation data, and get environment confirmation data. At this stage, yeah, as you can see, those models, in first email content, I should see information about activation leak and invite code, and in second one, for example, I have a link for my environment and the voucher, let's assume like that. And now, I have the, those interfaces. Message parser is basically just parsing data for me. I'm not ju just not putting that data, everything in one place, and uh, I just keep that uh, separated. But in general, what we see there, basically we are using our interfaces. And I used, uh, in that case, Mailhawk. You can just Google it. but. Uh, is doing exactly the same, just patching SMTP server and uh, allows you to retrieve your emails. And uh, to parse message content, it was a beautiful soup parser. It's just parsing the mail content and uh, reading the mail content and getting the valuable information for me. And in this case, actually, yeah, we, we just implementing implementing that interface. And environment-based object, the same is using our mailhawk and beautiful soup, like we receive uh, in, in it uh, a SMTP service and the parser. And there are only two important actions what we are should, what our environment uh, should do. It's just get activation email content and confirmation. How you would do that, it doesn't matter for me. I just want to test that logic and that's it. And uh, in code, it looks like that. I have some interfaces. Actually, pretty well-documented, self-documented code. You have uh, 
everything in one place and uh, you documenting what what is the purpose to have that method. Mm, you have a SMTP service and you have parser. Mm, you're getting the message content, you get activation data, you receive yeah, the same models there, you're expecting to, to get that models there. And uh, yeah. your Mayhawk, for example, just inherited from that and receives the same dependency there. And your patch object view looks like that. That for me, I also created there some kind of type var which is bounded to some type of service and uh, bounded to a message parser. And we just initialize it and get that data. What is the purpose to use interfaces there? Now, let's assume that tomorrow uh, our mail hawk will die. That service is just not, not available anymore. Or our parser, yeah, it's, uh, our beautiful soup will die. Now, we have a brief idea what, what, uh, what we are actually testing. And we have some kind of instruction already predefined in our interface. And only what you should do is just follow the steps. Mm, yeah. And that's basically it. Uh, And yeah, the last thing is the benefits and the harms of using interfaces. Uh, well, the, uh, the power of instance and is subclass. As I said, I strongly recommend you to read more about this custom types. It's really, there are a lot of use cases, this, uh, especially when you're using your own data structure, uh, something like that. Self-speaking code, as uh, I showed before, you you're would be able to define, you defining your interface as a black box. You just have an instruction what it should do and your class is just following that logic. Mm, could be used in, in cooperation with dependency ejection as I showed in my example. Yeah, it's, it works perfectly. I mean, you, for example, you have one long contract. In case of emails, I want to test how my um, service receive, send, validate emails. You have a contract. And even you not started writing any lines of code, I mean with business logic, but you already know that, okay, I know I should get the email content, I should parse it, I should know the link, and yeah, you just defining, it's like a book, you're just writing, and afterwards you're just writing the business logic on top of that. Uh, single responsibility and open calls uh, principles. Uh, actually, it would be great if you would follow the rules in your interfaces once you define them. Mm, the harms. Your interfaces are strongly restricted to have set of methods and properties. And it really depends how, how you treat that sentence. I mean, it could be a harm in one case, but in another, it could be the benefit, because if you want really restrict that uh, your class is responsible only for that, and please do not extend, expose the scope of that component, you just develop a microservice. You don't want to, that microservice will perform all the business logic and put everything in one place. And you know, simply making sure an interface method gets defined doesn't guarantee its correctness. And it's actually a tricky part because as you can, as I showed you, that Python enforces you to implement those methods, but it will not check the correctness of how you define them. And uh, it, it could be dangerous. Yeah, I, let's say that it's not a Java where your code wouldn't compile at all. But Python will allow you to do that, and it could be just dangerous. Required to take a look step in, it's definitely, because uh, if uh, you define an interface in a, in a very short period, you decided that interface should be changed, it's probably a sign that your interface are not necessary there, or uh, you just uh, defined them wrongly. 
would be dangerous in case of bad design. Yes, it's exactly what I said before. And the last one is DAC typing. And protocols are fundamental aspect of Python. And I'm now just summarizing that I'm not enforcing you to use interfaces, not at all. I mean, I really consider that they should be used only in case of necessity, really necessity. And uh, when you're writing your interface, you should be really sure that your class, I mean, child class, will do certain things and uh, have certain properties. It's something like just to be aware to not doing double job. I mean, if you define an interface and you decide to change it in the future, it looks like that if you would not use interface, then probably you will, be, you will have less work in the, in the real end. And Python's duck, duck typing has many advantages. When you, it's actually, it's flexible enough, and, uh, but it doesn't not solve all the problems. And ABC in Python offers an intermediate solution between a uh, free form of Python, actually that basic, basically that's like typing, and uh, bounding disciplines of uh, statically typed languages like Java. Because yeah, it's something somewhere in the middle. And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, the, that question is actually you will answer by your own for, uh, and uh, if you use this QR code, you will be able to find uh, the link for my GitHub repo where yeah, you will find all the code examples. Uh, you could briefly take a look on them and uh, all the diagrams, uh, what he prepared also are available using that link. Yo. We can move on to the question part. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, so uh, the first question is, uh, when does it make sense to use uh, static duct type, duct typing instead of ABCs? It's taste of matter. I would say for me the. ABCs are more clear when you have the classes and it's, I guess it's just taste of matter, but it's in under the hood, it's probably doing the same. But yeah, I got your point. Maybe we can talk about uh, it after that presentation, but yeah. Uh, dependency injection or inheritance? It's a great question. I mean, it's a, I, I have a stupid answer. It depends. Yeah, I mean, it really depends. When you, at some cases, you should use inheritance and, and others, you should uh, use dependency injection pattern. But uh, yeah, in interfaces, usually when you have to define strict relation between, in one contract you have defined, you want to define this relation between objects, probably you wanna use dependency injection. Uh, what is your favorite dependency injection inversion control container framework in Python ecosystem? Uh, to be really honest, I'm not using frameworks. I'm aware of them. I mean, if you just type in Google dependency injection Python, the first link uh, would be with that framework. I'm actually, as I said, I, I really like the Python nature, something that it's just a balance. You, I don't want to bring in Python that strict rules. It could be dangerous. Yeah, I agree with you that it could be dangerous when you, Python not forcing you to do something, but with some frameworks it will force you. But uh, yeah, I really like that flexibility and uh, yeah, I try to believe that developers will do their job uh, properly. Okay. Uh... That's a long one. What would be a good way to name an interface and its implementation if there is just one uh, interface item repository and one implementation default item repository? Uh, 
<laughs> that, that question is really a tricky one. I mean, uh, it's a good naming in that case. I mean, well, well you have uh, the default repository. You can, ask, you can maybe name it common, if it's a matter of uh, English synonyms, but <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Um, another one. What are the upsides to using abstract classes in Python over regular inheritance? Yeah, as I said, uh, that um, it's not suitable everywhere, and you should use interface if you really have a strong opinion to what that component should do. I mean, you already know that. I know that my microservice, which checking and receiving, validating the emails, is doing that. I'm pretty sure that it will not change in a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, I'm defining an interface which I could exchange in any moment. It's not actually a good answer for that question, but yeah. We can talk maybe afterwards. Okay, the last one is about project structure. Uh, if you have a multi-package project and each package uses interfaces, where do you put the files with interface definition, files with interface definitions? Uh, well, I would put, uh, it depends. You have multi-package project for, I would put inside your uh, package, uh, if you have, Yes, multi uh, I would put uh, that uh, file named interfaces that are relevant only for that restricted logic. I mean, I'm not sure what does it mean multi-package project. You are using your own Docker for that uh, for that component, or you're just it's just a monolith. But uh, I would put it uh, into the file named interfaces that would be relevant for that business logic defined. I, I, I really strongly recommend you to keep your components really small and clear in an understandable way. Not have one uh, file named interfaces and use it everywhere and then your file have more than 1,000 of lines and yeah, it just doesn't make sense. We want to keep it clear. Okay, uh, I think that's it. We are already past noon, so I encourage you to catch up with uh, Andre somewhere in the corridor. So thanks again. Yep, thank you very much.